Okay, so I hope you had your coffee in the break because we are going on a trip. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to take you on a journey. Oh, can Very you not nice. hear? Oh, there we are. Oh, the green button. Who'd have thought? <laughs> okay, yeah, so I hope you had your coffee because we're going on a trip. I am going to take you on a journey from outer space to ancient Rome, from the Playboy Mansion to the Deep South. I'm not a professor, I'm a journalist working on a book that happens to be quite relevant to some of the themes that we'll be discussing today. Um, so while there is something that gropes towards the thesis in this lecture, it's also a collage of ideas and people and things which I think are interesting. And also in the Q&A, my preference would be if it wasn't just you asking me to elaborate on some of the things that I'm talking about, it would be great as we are going into dinner after this and I segue, I think, to share what we think the answer to the question is. I want to put it to you, is progress a thing of the past? So maybe keep that in your mind. And as I am talking, maybe be thinking about what you think as well. And we can have a nice conversation. Um, to get started, in the summer of 1963, Playboy magazine hosted a roundtable of world famous science fiction writers to imagine the world in 1984. The future that these visionaries of progress imagined was mundanely hyperbolic. A world of weekend trips to the moon, instant sleep helmets, and stain-proof clothing. Now that's my favorite one, I think. <laughs> With the invention of handheld communications, the average Joe would run his production line from a Bermuda beach, they matter-of-factly predicted. Of course, there would be challenges. Society would have to overcome its visceral disgust towards aliens as we colonize new planets. Because an extraterrestrial looks horrid, we must not lash out and destroy it, cautioned Ray Bradbury. Human body styles like clothing would become outre or a la mode as the genetic couturiers who designed them came in and out of vogue, predicted William Ten. The West would eventually be locked in a race to invent a new breed of superhumans with the Russians perhaps, dis perhaps discovering how to create a man who could subsist on purely cabbage soup, Isaac Asimov mused. Now, I just want to show you just a small clip that a multimedia installation that was done by an artist, Gerard Byrne, um, in homage to this eponymous Playboy issue. If I can do it, let's have a look. Technology, eh? Right. We're just going to do the first minute or so because it's quite long. This is just to give you. Is it going to do? Is it going to do? No, no. Come on, come on. No, okay. No. It is working here, but not there. Okay, fine. We'll just have to move on. Fine. Yes. If anyone wants to see it, come and see me after. <laughs> Um, so, let's go back to the slide, first of all. Then we can move on. Okay, so, fast forward to... Okay, so in essence, if the future imagined in 1963 could be captured in an image, it would look something cool like this. Okay? Fast forward to 2019. I think it's fair to say that the futures being imagined look more like this. All this. <laughs> now, in 2019, um, New York Magazine ran its own compilation on expert predictions of what the world could look like in 20 years. It was not a multi-serial print series. It was a single listicle spinning off an eight-part podcast deep dive called 2038, which goes to show how much things have changed in my business, the print business, and how difficult it is to justify cerebral deep dives in a world of plummeting circulations and high printing costs. Long view meditations on the future, in other words, no longer sell. And in an interesting twist, the experts looking towards the future for 2038 were not so much science fiction writers as a hodgepodge of specialist journalists, politicos and technologists. 
a subtle difference that I think suggests that we no longer implicitly believe, as we did in the 60s, that the future is something that we can bring into being through sheer will of imagination and capacity for creative thought. Maybe in the 60s, story building and future building amounted to something that was the same thing. But today, we see the future as something to be observed rather than created. The deterministic outcome of various scientific, political, social, and geopolitical variables to be analysed and translated by professional interpreters and experts. In any case, the 2038 projects predictions were a far cry from the delightfully and perhaps chillingly hyperbolic visions that predominated in 1963. Atlantic journalist Kate Julian mused that we will be having a lot less sex, with many more people abstinent and VR and sex robot industries exploding. And Yalmina <laughs> warned that a new cultural, the new Cold War will lead to a split in the internet between the Libra web, a US-led federation of internet savvy states promoting a supposedly free, but nonetheless surveyed, internet rife with hate groups, and the Tranquil Net, a China-led alliance of nations committed to a harmonious internet of dissent, free of dissent and disagreement. The CEO of a digital product studio, Paul Ford, prophesied that there will be total surveillance at all times, with live footage of everybody's face connected to the internet. Meanwhile, as American politics becomes like it was during the antebellum age, more biased, more angry, more awash with rancor, China will rule the world. Bruno Maceus colourfully predicted in the 2038 series that a China-dominated world will be one of saints, spooks and soothsayers. Moral relations will be more important in a world which will also be more opaque, with the ideals of the Enlightenment, transparency, reason, no longer important. Living in this world will be more like working for the Department of the Defence in the US. Everybody will know as much as they need to know, and expert knowledge will become ever more fragmented. Just as cheerfully, Jeff Mann, a climate journalist, foresees the obliteration of the nation state as we are forced to create a global climate leviathan, a kind of world government order to force through lifestyle alterations and energy regulations to stop the planet from burning. But at least we can look forward to cool gadgets, eh? <laughs> Sadly, no. The verdict from Missy Cummings, a technologist at Duke, was that we should not expect driverless cars anytime soon. Mm. So the question is, is progress a thing of the past? Well, I think the first answer to that huge question is that many very clever and creative people nowadays believe it is. To put it very simply, the West's spiritual faith in progress, and I use that religious language intentionally, as will be explored in this talk, has imploded. For me, this is a historic moment of seismic import, an orthodoxical paradigm shift is underway. One, I think, is potentially comparable with the disintegration of the hegemony of the Catholic Church, which really gets going in the 16th <coughs> century, or the secularization of Christianity itself into liberalism from the early modern era into the industrial age. Now, the question is what or who killed that faith? It is worth taking a look at some of the iconoclasts who are shattering the old icons and tropes of progress, the influential disciples of doom, who have helped bring about a crisis of faith. Now, it's funny how this religious rebellion, as I'm going to frame it, feeds off old myths and religious stories. The overarching religious symbolism that encapsulates the loss of elite faith and progress is that winter has come for the Garden of Eden. Amid a halving of real GDP growth in Western countries since the 1970s, flat productivity and stagnant wages, a macroeconomic consensus has formed around the fact that slowing progress may well be inevitable. The cornerstone of this viewpoint is, of course, Lawrence Summer's theory of secular stagnation, which basically amounts to the notion that the once bounteous, dynamic West is inevitably shriveling in the face of an ageing population. Now, I don't want to turn this into an economic lecture, but secular stagnation basically comes down to there being too few investment opportunities to absorb available savings amid an aging population, which spells chronically weak growth. Now, the secular stagnation theory is complemented 
by the technology slowdown theory popularized by Tyler Cohen, who famously argued in intriguingly biblical terms in his book, The Great Stagnation, that developed countries may have exhausted the lowest hanging fruit for innovation, such as getting children to spend more time in education or settling new land. Another prophet of stagnation, Robert Gordon, has taken this even further, and I think he's on the reading list, arguing that from the late 19th century until the 1970s, the USA witnessed a single interval of rapid growth that was only made possible by a unique clustering of great inventions and will never be repeated. In his fascinating book, he details how small electrical machines made production lines possible. Electrical lifts allowed buildings to be built upwards, transforming urban land use. Motor vehicles replaced horses and the invention of white goods revolutionized housework forever. X-rays, antibiotics and anesthetics forever changed the face of medical care. But since the 1970s, innovations have proven less spectacular and more narrowly focused on entertainment, communication and information. And this Gordon blames on four growth sapping headwinds, education, demographics, inequality and government debt. I'm not going to go into detail on those now. Meanwhile, over on the left, since the crumbling of the Soviet Union, and with it the credibility of Karl Marx's economic determinism, that is his view in the inevitability of the collapse of the communist system, many on the left have swung from a perhaps reckless utopianism to a radical dystopianism. I think one manifestation of this is the rise of climate apocalypticism, and organizations like Just Stop Oil and Extinction Rebellion. And we see these groups basically partaking in iconoclasm, the desecration of symbols of Western civilizing progress. That's not just pouring green paint on the front windows of corporations, but also gluing themselves to fine art in major galleries. Now, another spiritual revolt against the religion of progress can be seen in critical race theory. Now, CRT, arose out of a deep and in pockets of the United States, I would add justified sense that the civil rights movement did not achieve the progress that African-Americans expected. When I went to the Deep South recently, working on a book that I hope will be out next year, I spoke to Elaine Turner, one of the famous Lee sisters of Memphis. And I'm gonna try and find the picture of her for you. That's, that is the Lee family. That's, that's Elaine. She's actually second from the right, if anyone's interested. So the Lee family was famously dubbed the most arrested family in America on account of having been jailed 17 times during the civil rights movement. Now, Elaine painted a really grim picture of what Memphis used to be like. She said, even if you didn't see the signs, you knew where your place was. You knew you couldn't go into that park. You knew which school you could go to, even if it was all the way across town and her stark matter-of-fact and unsensational heroism, braving two arrests as a teenager for having the simple audacity to sit at a whites-only lunch counter to me was so alien that it seemed to belong to another time. And as she told me with unvarnished frankness, we were so determined about what we were doing, we weren't thinking about whether we were gonna be afraid. You can't act out of fear. But what really struck me about Elaine was that she told me her story not with a triumphant pride, but with a dis bitter disappointment. Because Elaine and many of those who, are part, who were part of the civil rights fight are today convinced that progress was a mirage, that freedom has not been achieved, with African Americans still, as they see it, living in a white supremacist system. Now, Elaine's doubt with a capital D in the religion of progress really started to develop right as the civil rights movement was winding down and she realized that there were no black people working in Memphis's department stores. And obviously a big element of black frustration in America in particular endures around police violence and higher incarceration rates for African-American males. And again, as Elaine said to me, quoting her words, every time you're under suspicion, you're just black, you're out of place and then you're killed, shot in the back, shot in the head. It's hard to take in that a life can be taken without a second thought. That just doesn't happen to white people. 
Now, Elaine's views are sadly typical, and they have attained organised force as a result of critical race theory. Much of this is actually down to one man, the inventor of CRT, Derek Bell. And I think I've got his book as well on the reading list, um, which whatever you think of Bell is quite a compelling read. And anyway, Bell, while working as a civil rights attorney and an an academic, observed how landmark civil rights decisions failed to yield the impact hoped. One was that the integration of schools following the the Jim Crow era throughout the South, such rulings sparked white flight from public schools and the creation of private segregation academies, which meant that black students still attended institutions that were effectively separate. And so he constructed a theory that would blow a hole in the old religion of faith that the West was on a journey to relentless progress. Now, the tenets of his CRT doctrine, to crudely summarise, is that legal, social, cultural and economic structures are perpetuating inequality, in part through their continued naive insistence on colourblindness, meritocracy and the neutrality of law. What the right often misses in theories about great marches through the institutions and the infiltration of CRT is that it is at its core pessimistic and fatalistic. Now, Bell was an existentialist. He was obsessed with Camus and the Greek myth of Sisyphus, that is, the man who was punished by Hades for cheating death twice and forced to roll an immense boulder up a hill only for it to roll back down again every time it neared to the top, repeating this action for eternity. This is how Bell saw the so-called progress of African Americans. Inspired by Camus' claim that we must heroically fight the undefeatable absurdity of life and the inevitability of our own death, even if it is in vain, he called on African Americans to seek a kind of heroism in railing against a racism that was permanent, an injustice that could never be solved. That CRT has proved so divisive that it has alienated so many white people and perpetuated further division, one might argue wryly merely feeds the beast of Derek Bell's anti-progressive religion, rendering the inequality and alienation that CRT hopelessly rails against a self-fulfilling prophecy. Of course, again, as with radical environmentalism, one of the trademarks of the CRT counter-reformation are iconoclastic attacks on the iconography of progress, thinking about statues like colon- of colonizers like Cecil Rhodes. Cheery stuff, then. <laughs> but I think what is happening is actually about more than a loss of religious faith among elites and the left in the face of roadblocks to progress, real, <coughs> imagined, and the consequent formation of anti-progressive cults. I think it's easy to criticise and demonise those who have lost the faith, but I think in a way they are not wrong to be having their doubts, because here's the twist. I think that what has happened is in fact a genuine implosion of a story that we have told ourselves about progress for the last generation. And I think that it's down to the fact that the story was simply wrong. Now, it's worth briefly revisiting what that orthodoxy of progress was. Now, in the 1960s, there was a sense with the space race that the competition between the two superpowers would, by 1984, be driving unfathomable technological change and the colonisation of outer space. Now, I was going to show you a video um, about what happened in 1984 instead. Unfortunately, I can't. But some of you may be aware that in 1984, Apple uh, did a famous uh, advertisement um, that was shown during the Super Bowl, and it's basically the smashing of uh, a a screen which is showing a Soviet dictator who is, um, it was supposed to symbolise really the triumph of the liberal democratic system and it pre-shadowed the fall of the Soviet Union. And so I, it's, a great, it's a great advert, so I, I implore you all to go and ha- have a look at it. I'm sorry I can't show you now. But um, I think the West, so the West's story of progress ultimately went With the collapse of the Soviet Union, liberal democratic capitalism had emerged as the supreme civilization system in the modern industrialized world. 
Moreover, through globalization and free market policies, this system would divinely spread to all corners of the earth. Although one of the most crucial disciples of 1980s neoliberalism was Milton Friedman, who insisted that economic freedom was necessary but not sufficient for political freedom, a hubristic determinism to rival, I think, the doctrines of Karl Marx grew, epitomized in many ways by what I would argue is really the Bible of the old orthodoxy of progress which is Francis Fukuyama's end of history. In what can only be described as a Christian eschatology of the, last world, of the world of last things, Fukuyama famously argued that we were as close as we might hope to get to heaven on earth. The best possible mode of human existence, liberal democratic capitalism had been developed. Dialectical history was over with all fundamental world contradictions resolved. The timeless Manichaean battle between the forces of chaos and order had come to an end, leaving politics to melt into soothing shades of grey, i.e. centrism. True, there was a dystopian tinge to this earthly heaven, a new reality beckoned of comfort, vacuity and boredom. To quote from Fukuyama, there will be plenty of metaphorical wars. Corporate lawyers are specialising in hostile takeovers who will think of themselves as sharks or gunslingers and bond traders who imagine, as in Tom Wolfe's novel, The Vampire and of the Vanities, that they are masters of the universe. But as they sink into their soft leather of their BMWs, they will know somewhere in the back of their minds that there have been real gunslingers and masters of the world who would feel contempt for the petty virtues required to become rich and famous in modern America. Still, for Fukuyama and many of his contemporaries, this not quite so utopia was inevitable. The fall of the Soviet Union pointed to a universal evolution in the direction of capitalism, but also, in turn, an inevitable demand for recognition in the form of political rights across the world as a consequence of raising living standards. It was this view that, of course, inspired the now notorious neoliberal policies of the IMF and World Bank from the 1980s, which encouraged developing countries to lower trade barriers and taxes and embrace capital liberalisation. As globalisation reached fever pitch in the 1990s, the idea that the world was destined to become a kind of free capitalist paradise, a whirling carnival of cheap goods, a glorious cacophony of 24-7 entertainment, a bounteous paradise, 100 different breakfast cereals, and 1,000 prospective Pantene chains to redecorate one's bathroom with, really took off. This world of progress was a religion, one with iconic symbols, from Barbie, that plasticated talisman of glorious hyperconsumption, to McDonald's, with its cathedralic gold arches, promising respite and nourishment to all who entered their joyously decorated temples to standardized consumption at rock bottom prices. Now, gold arches, you see, it's crazy, isn't it? It's, this, you, you take a step back and think of all like, the religious symbols that, are, that undermine our everyday life. It is actually mind-blowing. Um, and the tech revolution only increased the spiritual intensity of this story of inevitable progress. Such a view is epitomized by Marshall McLuhan, the Baptist-raised tech pioneer and visionary who proselytized that with the internet, that is the communication of humankind in a transcendent web of interconnected reality, nationalism would be replaced by the global village. The Christian concept of the mystical body of all men as members of the body of Christ would become technological fact. Now, this account of inevitable divine triumph of liberal democratic capitalism has, of course, been disproven. The paradisic end of days never came. China's apparently successful brand of authoritarian capitalism has raised questions about the theory about the inevitability of the world's transition into a global, liberal, democratic, capitalist utopia. So too, Russia's rebellion against the liberal order 
having mesticized under Putin into a Gotham City-esque mafia state. The biggest neoliberal experiment since Milton Friedman's controversial offer of counsel to General Pinochet in Chile, that is in Iraq, has left the country in smoking ruins. The internet, instead of being a playground of liberation, is turning out to be a pixelated prison of surveillance, manipulation and censorship, with big tech having gained control of vital communications infrastructure. The expansive race for outer space has made way for a terrifying rivalry to control the virtual world, epitomised by the looming AI race between the West and China. Finally, Fukuyama's last man has been left to grapple not with a life of boredom, for it turns out that in the era of carcinogenic blocks that we walk around with, i.e. our phones, it is now impossible to be bored. Rather, the last man is left to face his imminent obsolescence and irrelevance as he is replaced in the workforce by robots. Looking back, from, apart from its religiosity and its perhaps naive simplicity, a peculiar attribute of the old religion of progress is the fact that it had an end. If the story that a civilization tells itself about itself is important, then perhaps the great historic error committed by the West, was that it wrote the last chapter. One might speculate about whether this reflects liberalism's Christian inheritance. After all, in Christianity, the world does end. The Bible's book of Revelation details Armageddon, the final battle on earth between the forces of God and Satan. But it is interesting to me that ancient Rome, long before it was Christianized, committed an almost identical sin. Augustus, after the Battle of Actium, declared the end of history, just like Francis Fukuyama. There would be no more military accomplishments greater than his, no major expansions in Roman territory, and men would now seek honour and greatness in the Senate rather than the battleground. And so it came to pass, there were no great generals after Augustus, no great conquests. Rome stood still, and it eventually decayed and fell. So it may be that great civilizations can go through this tragic pattern of experiencing great triumph and then consequently failing to imagine what they might possibly hope to contribute to the world next. But to bring the focus back to the modern West, why did liberal democratic capitalism, when at its zenith, give its own progress an endpoint? I think that the answer can actually be summarized in one word. Fear. can't take a trip through McKeithen because okay this is an old one so now I wanted to point you in the direction of some very interesting work that is being done at the moment by a man called Samuel Moyne he's not actually on the reading list because I came across him after I submitted it but he's a professor at Yale um, I'll show I will share some more details about him afterwards. He's an expert on Cold War liberals and in his fascinating lecture series at Oxford University last year, The Cold War and the Canon of Liberalism, which is available to listen to online, Moyne argues through the exploration of thinkers like Isaiah Berlin, Judith Schlar, rightly I think, that a particular Cold War liberal orthodoxy took hold after the Second World War. An orthodoxy that in the wake of the horrors of the Second World War and the spectre of the Soviet Union, as well as the dawn of universal suffrage, actually divorced liberalism from the radical hopes of its tradition. In particular, liberalism was hollowed of its enlightenment ideal of emancipated agency and limitless potential for progress. Put simply, liberalism turned its back on big ideas, ambitions and visions for fear that they could spark destructive revolutions. Liberalism, oh, liberalism lost its faith in humanity, recasting people as cognitively limited, dangerous and flawed, rather than rational agents of limitless potential. Thinkers like Rousseau and Kant, with their wild ideas about social contracts and daring to know, were banished from the liberal canon. Such an attitude is summed up in the common quip that Kant and Rousseau entered in Hitler and Stalin. The work of these Cold War liberals 
to sap liberalism of its ambition and energy coincided with another spiritual movement that sought to define freedom and progress in strictly economic terms. I'm talking, of course, about Friedrich Hayek and his most important disciple, Milton Friedman, the founders of the free market neoliberal movement. Um, little did this heretical sect, the Mont Pelerin Society, which met in 1947, know that they would be instrumental in the creation of a new orthodoxy that would take the world by force. Now, this old orthodoxy, a beguiling mixture of fear and ambition, optimism and pessimism, carnival and despair, abundance and oppression, has broken down, I think. And it risks being replaced by the cult of pessimistic fatalism, a belief in the inevitability of stagnation and decline. That is a cult of self-hatred, a belief that our civilization was flawed and rotten all along and deserves to be consigned to the dustbin of history. Now, for those of us who hope to revive the religion of progress anew, rather than to help to consign it to the history books, we are led to the inevitable question as to what a reformation in the story of progress might look like, what revision of the old orthodoxy is going to revive faith in our ability to carry forth the torch of civilization. First, I think we need to completely change the premises of that faith and progress. There is nothing inevitable about progress and there is nothing inevitable about decline. We also need to improve our scientific understanding of what drives progress and what drives stagnation. In terms of understanding where we are right now as we find ourselves in the grip of stagnation, I think that Stanford academic Eric Brynjolfsson's thesis, which has been offered as a challenge to Tyler Cohen's thesis, is helpful. Now, Eric's view is that far from winter coming for the Garden of Eden, a glorious new technological harvest is on the way. We just need to invent the tools to yield its bounty. He essentially argues that the current stagnation comes down to growing pains as we move from a tangible economy centered around mass production to an intangible economy driven by ideas, the knowledge economy. Most interestingly, he draws parallels between our current stagnation rut and the 30 year lag between the electrification of factories and the great takeoff of mass industrial production in America's factories in the 1930s. In Eric's view, computer power has the potential to be just as transformative as steam or electricity, but it could take several decades to work out how to work with computers and robots in fruitful ways. I would add to this the observation that we are still quite far from grasping that in an economy driven by ideas where people are no longer cogs in the machine, but sparky neurons feeding into giant company brains, Corporations will have to radically reorganise to tap the creative potential of every worker. And this will actually demand a dismantling of managerial hierarchies that characterise Western companies. And I think we have a tendency to underestimate just how tyrannical the average Western corporation is, especially when compared to other countries like Japan. And actually one of the reasons why places like Detroit in the Midwest went under was because the managerial nature um, of the factories and that they couldn't actually respond to the competition coming from Japan, where it is actually far more collaborative. The bottom line, though, is that where the old orthodoxy conceived of progress as linear, I think that the Reformation, if there is to be one, needs to bring forth a vision of freedom that accepts a more cyclical shape. And I'm really thinking of Thomas Kuhn's idea of paradigm shifts. And I don't know whether this is the updated slide show that I can show you. Oh, there we are. Yes. Um, so basically, Thomas Kuhn argued that science does not evolve gradually towards truth. Science has a paradigm that remains constant before going through a paradigm shift when current theories can't explain some other or other phenomenon and someone proposes a new theory. So basically, progress is lag, breakthrough, lag, breakthrough, lag, breakthrough. Once we set our sights on what broadly we need to achieve to end the current technological and macroeconomic stagnation then, I think, we then need to revise our story about how we get there. And so, ironically enough, I think that historians 
along with futurologists, science fiction writers and so on, will be crucial to any movement. For a generation, free trade, slashing regulations, lowering taxes have been seen as the ticket to the future. In other words, economic freedom has been the foundation stone of progress. In Hayek's Road to Serfdom, he depicts the history of civilization as basically one of trade and gradually opening markets. But I think that this needs looking at again. It may just be that it is freedom of conscience, that is the freedom to follow where one's free thoughts and intellectual inquiry takes you, and to freely express those thoughts in a market of ideas, that is in fact the secret recipe to progress. And I think as usual, the demos, ever maligned for its ignorance, its dangers, its reactionary impulses, is straight ahead of sage elites on this particular point as the backlash against Nat West captures. This is also something that historians have actually been looking into, by the way, for some time. One of my favourite historians, who is also on the list, has argued that the Industrial Revolution and the Scientific Revolution were both preceded by an intellectual awakening, which led to a vital breakthrough in how people thought about the world. Namely, that growth and the dissemination of useful knowledge was the key to material progress. Another fun way to approach this question of what actually drives progress through a historical lens is the Needham puzzle. Now, Joseph Needham was a British biochemist and sinologist, and all his life he was tormented by a single puzzle. The question of why China has the longest unbroken history of progress in science and technology, inventing the compass, gunpowder, printing, paper making, the kite, etc., etc., over 4,000 years, but didn't undergo a big bang industrial revolution as Britain did in the 19th century. Right up till when he completed his multi-volume science and civilization in China at the age of 91, Needham relentlessly pursued an answer to this one question. I think it is a very useful question to revisit because a big bang paradigm shift may be what we need to achieve today. Needham's answer was that China didn't discover the scientific method and it didn't do that because it had never had a bourgeoisie capable of introducing mercantile concepts of trial and error applied to profit making to technological development. But again, Moke has subsequently developed this theory in an interesting way, I think, arguing that China never, achi that China never achieved a high level of competitiveness in terms of the market for ideas. It therefore did not host the kind of breakthroughs, the kind of cultural, cultural entrepreneurs that can basically turn the world on its head and change things forever. Now for the West, this included Francis Bacon and his unique insight that scientific and economic progress depended on the combining and integration of the knowledge of technicians and the knowledge of science. This was key to what ended up becoming the steam engine. Now, Francis Bacon could only make such a proposition in a world of increasing intellectual freedom, where the Catholic Church, which had a strict Aristotelian view of science and were adamant that human beings were, as fallen creatures, condemned to ignorance about the mysteries of the natural world, had lo lost its spiritual and intellectual dominance. Bacon could make claims that by pursuing science, he was actually aiding Protestantism in the purifying of Christianity through the dispelling of pagan and Catholic superstitions. The question then is, what are the breakthroughs that we will need to make to ascend to the next level of progress? What cultural entrepreneurs will be required to radically turn the way we think about the world on its head what relaxation in taboos and intolerance will be necessary in order to allow these people to flourish? What battles for free speech and freedom of conscience will need to be fought? One thing I've been mulling recently is the Industrial Revolution was ultimately enabled by a biblical faith 
in man's ability to exploit nature to unleash relentless progress. Perhaps then the knowledge revolution can only be unlocked by the realization of the limitless possibilities for man and machine to work together. But we can't possibly hope for elites or even ordinary people to believe such a thing as long as we hold on to the Cold War liberal orthodoxy scepticism about the infinite creative capabilities of the average person. And so for now, I fear that we are stuck in the postmodernist age of deconstructing the old order of things, the age of scepticism, interrogation, and iconoclasm. Of course, merely tackling economic and technological stagnation won't be enough to convince people like Elaine Lee of the Lee family, the most arrested family in America, that progress is back with a vengeance. The fact is that many people are completely alienated from the old religion of progress with its emphasis on economic, capitalist, technological materialism. They conceive of progress in terms of justice, equality. But I think that this is partly because the obsession with equality and justice is a symptom of the fact that the old orthodoxy's emphasis on inevitable globalised capitalist progress did not do justice to the sacred link between individual freedom of the mind and radical progress. And it is only by reconverting the left to the religion of freedom that we can in turn hope to revive faith in progress. A progress that I, as I have tried to argue today hinges on freedom of intellect, speech and conscience and faith in the creative capacity of each and every one of us. To do that, what is needed, I think, is to actually invoke the slave's wisdom on freedom. I'm not talking now about Derek Bell and his futile existentialism, or CRT, but what, became, what came before that. The wisdom of the slave. Because in extension of the Baconian thesis, of combinatorial wisdom, what I think is demanded now is a sacred intersecting of the wisdom of the former master and the former slave, not the overthrow of master by slave, as Engels predicted, or an enduring domination of slave by master, as the new era of technocratic managerialism and liberal suspicion towards the demos eludes. Now, the wisdom of the slave is that freedom is the life force. For the slave Frederick Douglass, who became a prominent abolitionist, freedom was God himself. Like the Lord, it was both absent and omnipresent. He wrote, I saw nothing without seeing it, I heard nothing without hearing it, and I felt nothing without feeling it. It looked from every star, it smiled in every calm, it breathed in every wind, and it moved in every storm. The slave wisdom then is that to be free is to be a human being, that it is a universal divine right, not a luxury egoistic good, that freedom and agency and consequently progress comes not from material freedom secured by property rights per se, but man's self-possession, that the slave is not merely an extension of the master's will. Indeed, the ways in which slaves fought against the notion in small ways whether it was eating dirt rather than toiling in the cotton fields, faking illness by swallowing nails, or secretly worshipping in their own secretic fashion, or learning to read, should inspire and humble us all, whether we are black or white, pro-BLM or anti. Now, if we can combine this slave wisdom, that is the sanctity of the individual to direct one's own life and realise one's own true potential with the insights of the master, that coveting and desecrating the economic freedoms of others out of resentment of those who are better off will only need to lead to ruin and that the expansion of freedom and progress demands human sacrifice and toil, sacrifice that in a post-slavery era should fall equally, equally on us all, a new slash is called personal responsibility, then I think we have a great shot at building a democratic and social movement that can build support for a new era of progress. 
Yeah, like, we'll wrap it up, we'll wrap it up. <laughs> That's a lot to take in. In this slot, we have traveled from ancient Rome to the Playboy Mansion, from outer space to the deep south. I've speculated not unambitiously about whether it is required that we revive progress, not merely in a series of policies based on a more scientifically precise understanding of the dynamics of progress informed by history, but a full-blown religious reformation. And to conclude, I think we are at a historic juncture. The old orthodoxy on Western progress has crumbled. If it is to be salvaged, then reformationists will have to create a new story. They will have to do this in the face of a rival succeeding orthodoxy that progress is over, that stagnation is inevitable, that injustices are insurmountable and betray a civilization rotten to the core. Now, it's easy to be overwhelmed by this, but as Mark Twain said, the secret to making progress is to get started.